Good afternoon, and welcome to the last panel for the Transatlantic Symposium on Slavery. My name is Annette Gordon-Reed from Harvard University, and I'm going to moderate the panel on public memory and oral history. Uh, this is going to be a conversation, it's a round table, where we will talk about, our panelists will talk about their experiences with this, and we'll do that for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions from all of you. Um, this is a, such an important topic. I mean, there are so many people who are in history who were not allowed to make records, who could not tell their stories in ways that historians typically uh, find stories in papers and, and letters and so forth. And oral history and public memory are those kinds of ways that we are get into talking about history and how individual people make history and are a part of history. So to do this, we have some wonderful panelists, um, Andrew Davenport, Justin Reed, and Professor Alan Rice. And I'm going to call them forward to talk a little bit about their experiences. And once they are finished, then we will start the general discussion. So we will start with Andrew Davenport, who is the public historian at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, following some wonderful people in that particular role. He's a manager of Monticello's Getting Word Project project, which is all about oral history and memory and bringing forth stories that had not been told before. He's a PhD candidate in history at Georgetown and is a researcher and oral historian at Georgetown, the Georgetown Slavery Archive. So Andrew, welcome. Thanks so much, Professor Gordon-Reed, and, and, and it's such a pleasure to be with you and, and Justin and, and Alan. Uh, as Professor Gordon-Reed mentioned, I am Andrew Davenport. I'm Monticello's public historian and the manager of the Getting Word African-American Oral History Project. Getting Word is one of the signature projects of the International Center for Jefferson Studies and Monticello. And it was begun in 1993 by founders Lucia Stanton, Dr. Diane Swan Wright, and Ohio consultant Beverly Gray. And the project aims to record and interpret the oral histories of descendants of people enslaved by Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. To date, Getting Word has conducted uh, oral histories with 226 people, uh, which has helped to fundamentally transform interpretation of uh, Black life at Monticello and beyond. Uh, and through conversations with Andrew O'Shaughnessy and our colleague, Naya Bates, I began to see and theorize that Getting Word, which was begun as an archive of slavery, is actually more about uh, an archive of, of freedom, where the history and diaspora of thousands of, of people enslaved at Monticello, excuse me, uh, with, with the, the history of thousands of descendants of people enslaved at Monticello can be glimpsed. Mm -hmm. uh, so seeing through the lens of, of this particular population, we can see this archive of freedom in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll talk to you more about that. It's a fascinating project, of course, and uh, very much, much heralded. Um, Justin, G. Reed is the State Director of Community Initiatives at the Virginia Humanities. He's public public historian and cross-sector sector leader in cultural heritage advocacy and philanthropy. He manages the General Assembly's African American Cultural Resources Task Force, and he's the co-founder of the Lemon Project, the College of William and Mary, on race, public history, and memory. Welcome, Justin. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess I just wanted to uh, be begin by, by, by stating that, you know, this, this history is, is so recent. I think we have the tendency to, to regard it as being something that's in the distant past. Um, but I sit here today, you know, as a, as a quote unquote millennial, um, but I'm also, you know, the, the great grandson of enslaved Virginians. Uh, my mother's grandparents were born in slavery. And so when we, when we think about oral history and the power of oral history, it is a, something that can be very recent and reliable I mean, in, in so many ways. Uh, you know, I think a lot of my, my work around public memory and, and, and oral history began while a, a university student at William & Mary, uh, which happens to be, you know, the, it's the oldest institution of higher learning in, in the US South. It's the second oldest um, university in, in the United States and also happens to be the seventh oldest university in the English speaking world. So you know, arriving to William & Mary at the time that I did, we had a, a very proud history, but I don't believe it was a very honest history. Mm -hmm. And the Lemon Project 
was born out of student activism. Um, I was, was one of those students who felt that as an institution, we could do better in acknowledging the past and acknowledging it honestly. And so it was, it was born in, out of student activism. And today it continues you know, over a decade later and has done incredible work really connecting uh, with the local community, um, specifically black members of the community, uh, with, with black students and alumni and really peeling back the layers of history so that we can have that, that more um, authentic uh, narrative around the institution and our actual founders, um, the enslaved and uh, indentured uh, laborers at the College of William and Mary. Um, but also really want to emphasize that you know, the Lemon Project was, a, was an initiative that, that came out of intergenerational dialogue. And I think that's a common thread that I see between the founding of that initiative between public memory and oral history. Um, at the time that I was at William Mary, you know, we had we had an intergenerational dialogue, or at least to us, it seemed intergenerational because as a as a freshman, when you come in as a first year student, those upperclassmen, you know, seem much older and wiser. And I had the benefit of being mentored by uh, Tasimi Zagier and Rochelle Faithful, um, who um, over the course of, of their time at William Mary began to uh, push for uh, honest reckoning with our history. And upon their graduation, um, handed the, the torch to me for me to continue. But it was also an intergenerational dialogue between student activists and our faculty mentors. Um, Terry Myers, um, an English professor, had begun to uncover a lot of this early history. And he wasn't even a professor of mine, um, but he took the time out to mentor me and to meet with me and to have conversations with me in his office. And then Jody Allen, who was, was my advisor, uh, Jody Allen today directs the Lemon Project, um, but she also invested so much time into me and was teaching me how to be a public historian and oral historian. And so at the same time that I was learning from them and grappling with my own family history, you know, as a student activist, we were able to push for some of the changes that we knew our mentors also wanted to see. And so it's the coming together of, of these mutual goals that I think was, was critically important for this, this work happening at William & Mary. And I think that's truly the power when we talk about oral history and public memory, it's this intergenerational communication, whether it's through the built environment, whether it's verbally, in many cases, non-verbally. Mm -hmm. We're inheriting so much from the past. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Professor Alan Rice is a professor in English and American Studies at the University of Central Lancashire. He's the co-director of the Institute for Black Atlantic Research director of the UCLan Lancashire Research Center in Migration, Diaspora, and Exile. He is the author of numerous works. And you know, I would like to say I've actually been to Lancashire <laughs> uh, to do research on my own book, on my own family research, John Wales, um, there at Preston. So it's, it's wonderful to welcome you here. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Annette. Um, I, I really wanted to start by saying that, in a sense, um, memory uh, in Britain of slavery is a is almost an amnesia, a time of imperial melancholia, as Paul Gilroy puts it. There is so much forgotten, and yet this forgetfulness comes only six years after the final payment was made in compensation to the slave holders. Mm -hmm. So uh, the twenty million, seventeen billion in today's money which went to the uh, slave owners in Britain and its empire, has only just been paid back. How can we forget when the debt is so close? Um, what I'd like to say is that we at the Institute for Black Atlantic Research and through uh, Labaina Hamid, the uh, Turner Prize winners, Making Histories Visible project, work on a range of different things to try and keep these memories alive or even at times to try and push those memories to the forefront so that slavery does not get forgotten. Um, and what um, uh, one of the ways that we, we do this is by working closely with local communities, with the Preston Black History Group, with um, the Lancaster, the newly formed Lancaster Black History Group. Mm -hmm. And what the Lancaster Black History Group did was to say, this is not a moment, the moment of Black Lives Matter, this needs to become a movement. And they've set up a, a, a slave families project. And this project is not about um, uh, the black families in, in Lancaster as such. It's about the seven 
prominent white families who were involved in the slave trade. And through them, we find the stories of their black enslaved servants um, whose lives are virtually invisible. But what we're trying to do through this project and subsequent projects is to create portraits of these people, imagined portraits. So what I'd like to say about um, um, public memory and oral history is sometimes you have to be exceptionally creative mm -hmm. to kind of reconstruct these histories. These histories aren't there for us to pluck from the archives easily. All we have in Lancaster are 49 baptismal records mm -hmm. for these people. That's all we have until suddenly in 2018, the, um, we, we, we found that some of the slaves had escaped and they're in the adverts, mm -hmm. uh, escaped slave adverts in Britain. And one of them, was an Ibu boy mm -hmm. and he was aged 14 mm -hmm. and he had scarification marks on his uh, face mm -hmm. and he spoke with a broad Lancashire dialect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what I'd like I'd like to, to say and the people in Lancaster Black History Group would like to say he is ours as well as Africans mm -hmm. he, he is ours on the tip of his tongue and one of the things we need to do is to kind of reconstruct people mm -hmm. like him, their histories, however mm -hmm. hard that is. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Well, now we're here all together. Um, and I'd like to start just to ask throughout a question. And as I said, this is a round table. So if things occur to people, questions you want to ask uh, to one another. Um, or to me or whatever, it's fine. But on this last point, when Alan, if, if I might call you Alan, um, was talking about how they do their work. I, if you could just, you know, Andrew and Justin, expand upon that. Because when you, we talk about oral history or public memory, but particularly oral history, I, I would think people in the audience and others might want to know, how do you do this? For, uh, historians, when I want to start writing about something, I go to the library, <laughs> I go to, there are definite places where I can get started. So how does this work um, for you, Andrew and Justin and the Lemon Project and getting word and those kinds of things? How do you, how do you get going with, uh, with, with your projects? If I could speak to the, to the origins of, of getting word in, in 1993, it really begins with, really, with relationships. And uh, Cinder Stanton and uh, Diane Swan Wright knew that Monticello in particular had very difficult, disturbing relationships with local African-Americans in Albemarle County. Uh, and when they began to look for descendants of people enslaved in Monticello, they knew that they needed to uh, better these relationships. And when they uh, identified uh, descendants living in Southern Ohio, descendants of Madison Hemings, uh, Sally Hemings's and uh, Thomas Jefferson's son, um, they had a relationship with a local uh, historian there, Ms. Beverly Gray. Uh, and so uh, everything here um, regarding the actual ethical practice of oral history involves uh, um, uh, making relationships, um, uh, trusting one another, and embarking on uh, what can be a, a really profound, meaningful process. So, I mean, so again, sort of contrasting it when you think of traditional history historians, you know, not only do you go to the library and you go through archives and so forth, it's sort of, you're by yourself to some degree until the point in which you come out and you want to show things to your colleagues and so forth. But you're saying this is a collaborative. Would you say it's a it's quintessentially a, a collaborative effort? Quintessentially collaborative. This is all about shared authority and entering into uh, a dialogue, as, as Justin was describing earlier, uh, between another individual, right, or groups of individuals. And so it involves a great deal of humility, I would say, to walk in and, and listen. And that's what we're doing. We're sitting at the feet of of informants of of subjects who. Um, uh, may never have been asked uh, or have been purposely excluded um, or erased from the archive. And so our job is to expand the available pasts for remembering, as anthropologist David Scott says. And we do that through uh, these conversations and recording these conversations. And now it's easier than ever to do that with, mm -hmm. uh, with smartphones, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Justin? Yeah, I thought Andrew you know, summarized this work beautifully. And I think there are a lot of things that, that translate also for the Lemon Project as well. I mean, I, I would describe the Lemon Project more as a, as a public memory project, 
with oral history being you know, one component, um, there's been you know, incredible work engaging members of, of the surrounding Williamsburg community that's connected to uh, William & Mary, also interviewing Black alumni and, and their experiences you know, at, at William & Mary. Um, but as, as Andrew said, it, it really comes back to allowing the, the time for relationships to be developed and for that trust to be built. Um, it's, it's critical to, to be open to whatever the interviewee right is, is, is open to to saying, and it, it may not even be you know what you intentionally thought you were seeking, and you have to follow you know whatever is, is shared with you in, in many different directions. But I think ultimately, uh, it, it, it comes down to this principle of, of being open and showing that that openness and, and really showing interest and, and the willingness to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan, do you have any more on this? Yeah, I, I suppose what, what I'd say is that um, we're constructing the stories from what we have, and we don't have uh, the unbroken chain to us of the um, descendants often. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes things much more difficult, but also maybe it allows, what it allows is um, creative modes and means so those stories can be told for other ways. So we have the Lancaster um, Sewing Cafe Lancaster are making a, a are constructing a, a banner or sewing a banner with the stories encoded in there that we found out as far as we found them out mm -hmm. as a means of kind of kind of trying to tell that black story which cannot be reconstructed from oral memoir. So mm -hmm. I think I think that oral memoir is, is wonderful. We we're on work. We've been working or trying to work on a project with local Prestonian, Preston Black people, talking mm -hmm. about Windrush uh, coming yeah. to Britain before. And that's much easier, obviously. But we're talking a, a broken chain. The, the, the descendants here, then we don't have them in Lancaster. Um, mm -hmm. We have a Black community, but they're, they're a newer Black community. And they want to find out about previous Black communities in Lancaster. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if you're in Liverpool, and Liverpool does wonderful things, uh, it has a much older black community, can do, do oral memoir in a very different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, like Andrew and Justin have talked about. Mm -hmm. So one thing you said when you were in your, your introductory remarks, you were talking about speaking with, uh, talking about the white families in, mm -hmm. in, in Lancaster. Do you, what kind of resistance, and I can, I'm gonna ask this to all of you, but just as a general matter, what kind of resistance do you get to this, or do you get resistance to this, these kinds of efforts? There's a gigantic resistance in, or historically in Lancaster, to talking about the story of the history of the city in terms of slavery. They want to talk about the beautiful furniture. Gillows <laughs> is an amazing um, wearing in Gillows. A beautiful, beautiful mahogany furniture. And people just don't want to talk about that what what created that and these specific families we've got local community historians 40 of them working or it, from the age of 14 to 80 on those families and we're in touch with some of the descendants they want to frame the narrative though in their own way so we we think it's really important to engage with them but not to allow them to frame the narrative the narrative has to be framed by the community historians and the expert historians mm -hmm. um, but, but you have they've, they've got material which we don't have a, which we need to get access to so you know uh, but they they really want to frame the narrative in ways that will will allow their um, descendants off the hook off the, and their descendants can't get off the hook we, we we've, we've actually documented what the, what what involvement they had well that's that's a really delicate balance it would seem. Mm -hmm because this would be present, Andrew and Justin, in your work as well. You know, families, of course, have an image of themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, they have a story they want to tell. And even if they're the fam descendants of enslaved people, there may be, they may have a, a perspective about that, uh, about their family that may or may not be correct. I mean, and I certainly, in my work, encounter that sometimes, you know, with people who have a, a vision of their family. And, uh, it sounds like a very you're you have to be a diplomat in some ways i mean you're you mentioned alan that you need you need material from these people yeah but well, you can't tick them off too much because well, then they withdraw 
Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're in the midst of that at the moment. I don't want to comment too much specifically okay. on that because we are in the midst of it at the moment. But we are in negotiations with descendants, some of the families, over um, uh, heirlooms and, and things which would be really useful for our community historians to see. Mm -hmm. and, and and we we don't want to uh, we don't want to uh, uh, we want to we want to be on that delicate line on the right side of it, mm -hmm. but in both ways we want to tell to tell the full story, uh, but we also don't want to alienate the families. So mm -hmm. you know that's our problem, and I think that's the dilemma for anyone working with these kinds of issues. But but we are not going to whitewash, mm -hmm. and that's that's why I've set up a. Um, uh, a map and a slave trial and we name all the families and we name where they lived we name the black servants slave servants they had and we name the profits they made and the ships they sent out uh -huh. so that that i developed uh, a new version of that trial with much more black agency in it just last year uh -huh. justin do you encounter this kind of these issues how do you handle these things yeah no and, it, and it's interesting i, I have well, and i will say because there's sort of a different perspective. He's talking about enslavers. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, you're talking about people who are enslaved. And so both of them can have perspectives. You might, I guess you could say that there is there, could there be a tendency to, uh, to be less uh, hardcore with the people who are descendants of enslaved than enslavers? I mean, is there, is there a different way of, of, of a, of viewing the material because he said, you know, Alan, you said, you know, you, the, you, you have to listen to them as you suggested, Justin, but in the end, it has to be the historians who say, you know, this is the, who does who, the historians who do the presentation. Right. Well, you know, bo both perspectives are, are valuable, right? Obviously valuable in different ways. And I think, you know, all of us who are trained in, in oral history, you know, the methodology requires us to, you know, to not interrupt, right? To ask open-ended questions, you know, to try to reserve our opinion and to not interject and to really listen and mm -hmm. listen intently. And I guess when I say listen, you're all, you're also listening for what's not said and yeah. kind of reading in between the lines. And to me, it's, it's always fascinating. I mean, I guess when you're thinking about memory and history, in some ways, memory becomes more valuable, valuable because it, it's, what people believe to be true mm -hmm. and you're exploring why they believe what they believe versus you know what may have actually happened right and so mm -hmm. you know in, when i'm doing this work i've become much more fascinated in, in the question of why a person has a certain memory or believes what they do mm -hmm. sometimes more than what actually ha happened the actual history mm -hmm. I mean, in many cases and i think you know, psychologically, that that gives you a window in, into um, you know, so so many kind of rationales and, and 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 deeper level understandings for historical acts, and you can see how people have processed that history across time, and how they've dealt with trauma, or how they've even um, you know erased you know certain memories in order to deal with trauma. And I think you know when you start getting into the the, the psychological underpinnings of, of of memory and why people are transmitting certain interpretations of history you really are able to kind of dig deeper into some, some kind of human human nature uh, dilemmas when it comes that, to that. That's very tricky. I mean, that would be really, could be really painful um, for, for families. How do you, I mean, have you ever been brought up short? I mean, talking to people about things that are deeply personal and family, uh, as you're saying, that shape family's understanding of itself. That's a, that's a huge, responsibility. I mean, it's one thing if you're, again, in an archive, looking at a book or reading people's letters and interpreting what they're doing, but you're face to face with people who may be, you know, dealing or living with the results of trauma. And and I'm, I'm really curious to, you know, to, to hear from Andrew on, on this, but I, I'll say, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the oral history work that I've, I've been involved with hasn't directly tackled the issue of slavery. I think slavery is Often unspoken. So you know, if you're talking to uh, you know black descendants, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll use I'll use my you know my grandmother as an example. Um, you know, she very vividly remembered her grandmother who her grandfather who helped raise her. Um, he was born in slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, 
she lived with him for a good part of her childhood and would constantly talk about him, but never once mentioned that he was enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're touching the, the, the subject, but not necessarily doing it directly. I mean, so I don't, I don't think people are necessarily communicating a lot of the trauma that they experience. I think you know, when we're gathering these oral histories, it's an attempt to, you know, by the interviewees to, to share, you know, some of the, some of the maybe best aspects of their family history um, or, or the things that they're proud of, mm -hmm. experiences that bring them the most joy. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, Mitch, early, you kind of have to listen to the silences and the things that aren't being said. You know, it's, it's in those things that aren't being communicated that you, you find are usually connected to trauma. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Andrew? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that we need to listen to the oral histories of, of descendants of, of enslavers as well, because oftentimes they may be on land that where where black people are buried, right? Where ancestors are buried. Uh, there's more, there's a famous quote, there's more, oftentimes more black history in white people's family Bibles than there is uh, elsewhere. So we need to have these these relationships. And yeah, they, they can be really challenging. I, I remember I, I was conducting an uh, informational interview with a descendant of an enslaver in Alabama. Um, you know, these families are entangled, right? Black families and, and families of en uh, former en enslavers are entangled. And um, this uh, descendant of an enslaver had uh, said to me off the record, but um, I won't share a name, but uh, the descendant had said, uh, what if they're lying in the oral history interviews, talking about descendants of enslaved people? You know, and she was asking me about the very methodology of what we do and if we could even trust any type of oral history at all. And that gets to what Justin was asking about, why would you think that they would need to lie, right? What is it about your own kind of psychological makeup that would, would lead you to ask if someone were lying about a particular uh, historical um, event. Um, and so what I try and do um, with these relationships is just say flat out that my only friend is truth. I'm just here to interpret the truth. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the truth will come out. And so uh, those relationships can be really challenging. In my personal life, I have my uh, grandmother's grandparents were enslaved. And I have tracked down three of the four enslaving families of her grandparents. And I've met individuals from each of those three families. And those are really trying conversations. But what I say is I'm not here for anything except for information and to say that we're here. And my only friend again is truth. And I wanna know that our oral history is confirmed and confirmable. And I would like to establish a relationship because I would like to know how you have remembered as well. Mm -hmm. And what do they say? You said that they're difficult. What What is the, uh, how does that express itself? The difficulty. I mean, just um, is it just uh, in their their manner, in their uh, what they're willing to share and not share? How? I, I, I think it's I think it's difficult because it, it, it can be so emotional, right? Um, but so far, I've had successful personal personal relationships with with, with a handful of, of the people that I've met uh, from these families. So. Uh, it can be difficult, but it can be overcome, right? And, and to connect, and that's what we're here for, to learn the truth, to connect with one another and move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you find, you, Alan, you were gonna say something? No, no. No, I was say, do you find that there's not re resistance, not just resistance in terms of, of particular issues, you know, families who may be embarrassed or concerned about, um, their ancestors' involvement in, in slavery or other kinds of practices. Um, is there re resistance to oral history? How do, how do people, do, you, do people look askance at it in some way? Has it been your experience that people think that it's somehow not, you know, how do they know they're telling the truth? Well, how do you know that historians, are t I mean, are telling the truth? Is there, do you see oral history as, as, uh, as treated as something less than traditional type of history? And, and has that changed over time? I mean, I, I, I've definitely seen um, oral history become more valued in, in, in recent years. And I think, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, these movements around de decolonization and, and looking at, you know, how, how we do 
historical research. I think there's much more criticism directed towards some of the documentary evidence, I think, right? We, there are instances where we can use the oral history um, to get to the truth more than we can you know, use the written records that have been left behind and, and curated or edited. Um, and I think you know, when we combine these two resources together, then I think as Andrew says, you know, we can get to that, that deeper level truth. Um, I, I, I tend to, to not you know, discredit oral history because you know, as I was, I was trying to say earlier, to me, it's, it's almost more important to, to know, you know what a person believes to be true. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like to see, because that's that's shaping their everyday life and their perception of themselves uh, more than the actual history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I've definitely sensed uh, a shift. I mean, we, we see it in, in I guess, the graduate programs that are now being developed, you know, that are focusing more on, on oral history uh, methodologies and, and training. And, you know, I, I, I feel as if when, when we think about you know, the, the global South and you know, non-white communities and the descendants of, of, of enslaved peoples here in the U.S., uh, that, that oral tradition, in many cases, is all that we have. And so when we say that it's, it's less than or is it, you know, it doesn't mean as much or is it as valuable, you know, we're also, you know, kind of indirectly devaluing the descendants themselves who mm -hmm. carry and cherish that, that tradition and memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I'd just like to say, I mean, my, my grandfather didn't read and write, and I, I got together his oral history, and that oral history is being used by people who breed Arab horses, because he, he became an Arab groom all over the world now. You know, they loved his stories, and those stories can tell them about things they wouldn't know beforehand. So that there are there are ways in which these forms of knowledge forms of knowledge go across loads of different ways and what i'd like to say really is that actually i think there's a third thing i think there's all histories i think there are histories based on archives and i think there's the imagination and creativity and i actually think that artists and writers um, can get to the truth of things sometimes as well and that's why i work very closely with artists and writers especially the artist um, Jade Montserrat. And she's, she lives in, in Newcastle, and she's a, a black woman there, so not in Newcastle, in, in Scarborough, in northeast of England. And she, she, she lives there, but has there isn't a large black community there. And her artwork is about trying to connect with the, the land and the, uh, and the earth. So, so she, she uses that to start saying, I belong here to start thinking about there having been black people there before. Not that she, you know, she's, she's, she's separated from them in so many ways and she uses her artwork to try and connect with them. The Baina Himid, the Turner Prize winner, did a piece of work called uh, Swallow Hard Lancaster Dinner Service where she had portraits of black slave servants on, um, on beautiful 18th century plates. So she overpainted those portraits she said, I've tried to imagine the lives of the almost invisible slave servants. These men owned, bought from the plantation for work in quiet isolation in this chilly place. They look for clues, connections, ghosts, heroes. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is that actually, I think if we had a tripartite look at this, mm -hmm. it tell us a truth mm. which rests alongside the historical truth we might get them to, to a kind of a space and a place where we can see these things in 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 a around so i'd mm. say yes oral history yes public memory yes this kind of um archival history all are important but the problem is if you if you elevate one of these up above the others there's a real problem we need to use them all but we also need to use our creative imaginers too mm -hmm. andrew yeah that's right I, I think oral history should be uh, given equal weight as every other historical source and it should not be devalued in the recent kind of upsurge of, of interest and um, the legitimacy of oral history is determined because 
uh, we recognize it now to be just as legitimate a source as any other historical source. And I'll tell a, a brief story, and I shared this with Justin the other day and Professor Gordon Reed, I'm sure you, you, you know it because it deals with uh, a, a white descendant of, um, of uh, uh, a family in Chillicothe, Ohio, just outside, actually right where Madison Hemings had lived. And in the late 90s, this man, Ray Malone, and he's featured on the Getting Word website, um, he gave an interview to Getting Word and uh, his great, great uncle was a neighbor of Madison Hemings. And what had come down in that white family was that all Thomas Jefferson's papers in the world, all of, combined with all of the papers of every Philadelphia lawyer in the world, meant nothing compared to, to Madison Hemings's work. Uh -huh. so every piece of, of, of paper that Jefferson had, all 19,000 letters that we have, was nothing really, um, it, it, it didn't have the same kind of weight as Madison Hemings's words, because his word was his bond. And to Justin's point earlier about curation, right? Jefferson obviously selectively edited and curated many aspects of his personality and his life, but his son did not, right? What his son said in 1873 to, um, to, uh, to a newspaper reporter remained the truth. And we can see if we were to do a side-by-side -side analysis of, of Jefferson's papers, right? And Madison Hemings's words, just in a couple hundred word uh, newspaper article, we will see, like Ray Malone said, that all the paper in the world doesn't doesn't come up to uh, Madison Hemings's uh, words. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and I, Justin, you were going to say something. Well, I, I, I wanted to kind of add something to to what Alan stated. I mean, he, he talked about I guess the, the creative and performing arts and you know oral oral history being one leg, and then you know we have you know, archival research being another leg. And I think you know we we be remiss if we also didn't recognize. I think the the incredible work that's happening in the sciences that also connect back to history. Um, we've seen so many strides in recent years around epigenetics. And, you know, when we talk about um, you know DNA research and being able to look at you know behavioral sciences. I think there there's a fourth leg to this. I mean, there's a, there's a public memory that is not verbal and is not written, and it appears in you know, how we occupy space and how we move through the world. Um, it, you know, it appears in in the things, in the mannerisms um, that we inherited unconsciously. I, I think there's a there's a fourth way that history and, and public memory, right, is, is, is manifesting itself. And it, and it comes in, I think, often more, more subtle ways. Uh, and I, and I, I think of a, a recent example of, of descendants of enslaved people who, who are reunited. You know, these are relatives who have reunited because of, of these these advances in DNA research, and they're coming together and recognizing that, you know, having never met before, there are still similarities, you know, in how they communicate, or in certain foods, or you know, things that they 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 do with their family. They're seeing it um, in branches of their family they they never met before, and I think you know even from my own experience, you know, having grown up in in a, a predominantly black rural space. You know, when I attended university, I saw you know very kind of distinct kind of cultural parallels in my friends who were West African and my friends who were West Indian, mm -hmm. and I think you know these are things that are also part of the our, our memory and our inheritance of memory that you know can't necessarily be articulated verbally, but you can you can either discern um, from you know scientific research or from you know, the behavioral sciences. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's the fascinating thing about all of this, even in my, in my own work, um, thinking about recovering stories that are, as I said, started out not told, you have to use everything. That's right. You know, it's not n enough to just go and look at letters and say, this is what he said, and this is what she said, and then that's it. Um, you're recreating, you couldn't do that in your own life. I mean, if you wanted to tell the story, you know, if you wanted to compile all of the, you know, Facebook posts or letters or emails that people write, there would still be a huge amount of most of the person's lives lived outside of that. And there have to be ways to get at that. And what you guys are talking about, what you were describing today is the way to, to try to tap into that. Uh, oral history, the archive, the oral history works with the archive because one of the things you do when you said that you, you when people are telling a story that they want to believe versus one that's uh, that's the, 
made more likely true. You know that because you've gone some other place and you've got you've looked you've corroborated what they're saying. You can look outside of that. And so you do think, well, why is this particular story being told, which is a, a story in itself versus the, the thing that you may have been pursuing. But there are ways to look at all of this uh, from an artistic standpoint, from the archive, from other, use whatever tools are available. Science, obviously our very bodies tell a story about who we are and to whom we're related. And that opens up a lot. What what do you think about the the politicization of all of this? I mean, history is is has become really. Uh, I don't know if this has happened in in, in the UK, uh, but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess everywhere. Um, how does that relate to what you do? Does it does it make it more difficult? Yeah, can, can I just speak to Britain because you asked me specifically? We have a really difficult moment at the moment. Uh, where historians are being traduced for bringing slavery up by a very right-wing government. If we, if we bring it into the conversation, we're told that we're woke, that, um, that, that it shouldn't, shouldn't be brought up in the conversations around uh, these aristocratic families and around their houses, that we should uh, not be doing this, and that it actually is cancelling. They talk about it cancelling history. And, um, you know, we need to fight back against this, but we only fight back against it by using the, these specific tools. We can't fight back against it purely in rhetoric. We fight back against it with these many tools that we have as cultural historians. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that well, I don't want to go on to a, a, a TV debate with someone and just kind of shout across at them. I like to go on to a TV debate with a kind of sheaf of papers that I could just say, well, there's this, there's that. And basically our uh, armor as public historians is the work we've done. And um, the problem is that those who attack us don't need to do any work. They just used to need, you need to use words like woke and cancel and mm -hmm. shame. Mm -hmm. And we've got to try and keep very calm and say, here is the work, mm -hmm. here is the work. Okay. I was thinking that it shows how important are the stakes that politicians are really paying attention to what's going on in the historical field, right? I came across a quote just yesterday uh, given to me by a colleague, Steve Light at Monticello. It's a Tony Judd quote, and if, if I can read it, because I just wrote it down and put it on my wall for, for safekeeping. Uh, Tony Judd says, uh, the historian's task is not to disrupt for the sake of it but it is to tell what is almost always an uncomfortable story and explain why the discomfort is part of the truth we need to live well and live properly. A well-organized society is one in which we know the truths about ourselves collectively, not one in which we will tell pleasant lies about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I try and keep that in mind. Ever since mm -hmm. I learned it just yesterday, I will always yeah. try to keep it in mind. Well, it's, it's a very interesting time. I mean, history has come to I mean, even traditional, the so-called traditional history has come in, under attack. And uh, we're in, in, in a moment when people seem, um, you know, really hell bent on going after historians for telling stories that, as you say, that are un, unpleasant. And I just wondered if that's, have you thought about how it might, Justin, have you thought about how that might change what you do or, or, or not? Uh, you know, and I, and I guess you know we're we're all connected to you know, the public humanities in, in, in different ways, and it's, it's definitely at, at the forefront of our mind. At, you know, at the organization that I, I work for, you know, Virginia Humanities, we're you know one of fifty six state humanities councils, and I think all of these state humanities councils are, are grappling with you know our our charge to um, you know foster empathy and connection and understanding, and the backlash that we're seeing across the country, uh, you know. It's, shape, it's shaping the work that I do and the work that I that I caught and the work that my colleagues do is, is impacting what we do. And I, I believe it's, it's only making us want to do more um, and it's motivating us to, to, to do more. Uh, you know, I don't I don't think we've we've ever been an organization, you know, that's been interested in uh, 
the myth making and, and mm-hmm. like, fiction, fictionalizing of, of history. We've always been in pursuit of the truth and more truths. Uh, and I think the, the backlash, you know, that we're witnessing in the United States specifically about the United States is that we're really for the first time, I think, in our in our existence as a nation, being exposed to more perspectives of history that are mm-hmm. that are challenging the myths, right, that have been inherited across time. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, one of the things that, that I've been kind of really interested in doing, I guess because of this political backlash, is really helping the kind of the general public make that distinction between history and memory and, mm-hmm. and heritage and myth. I mean, these are all different things that sometimes become conflated. Mm-hmm. And so we can recognize that you know, the story that you've in, inherited, you know, the, the, the myth perhaps that your family told you um, about, you know, this, this country kind of is in direct conflict with the documentary evidence mm-hmm. <laughs> with, you know, some of the scientific research that exists and with the oral histories from you know, this huge swath of, of, of the nation that we previously never listened to. Yeah. So you know, now what do we what do we do with that? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. yeah, well that's I mean the last part, I mean what you all of you what you said, particularly the last part of it is critical that we're now hearing from people we're using a form to hear from people that we haven't heard from before, whether it's uh, referencing public memory, whether it's through art whether it's the oral history, we're now hearing voices, the voices of people and the perspectives of people who didn't write things down and write books and, and what we've been focusing on for um, so much of in the past. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Now, I'd like to bring the audience into this right now. Um, Maria Vorel, as people from past um, generation to generation, stories evolve with the people. How do you think about the factual accuracy of the stories? Does it matter? I guess she's saying this, you know, this is a gigantic game of telephone here. Uh, how do you um, uh, how do you assess the accuracy of these things and does accuracy matter? I'm, I'm trying to make eye contact with Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll, 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 share, I'll share my opinion, and, and I, I believe that the kind of the ac- accuracy does, does not matter. I, I, again, it's more important to to simply know, you know, what's been transmitted, why it's been transmitted, and and what people uh, believe to be true. In some, in many cases, um, that's more important than you know, trying to discern, you know, the ac- accuracy. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, Andrew. I think accuracy and the transmission and why it was transmitted is it are, are equally important. There, there's a story in the Getting Word archive about uh, Tarleton's raid on, on Charlottesville, and <laughs> on, on Monticello in particular. And the story is passed down in the Black family who's descended from Jupiter Evans, uh, Thomas Jefferson's enslaved uh, manservant. And uh, the, fam- the same story has also been passed down uh, through Jefferson's white descendants. And the story is that uh, Jupiter or his brother um, hid the family silver beneath the porch uh, in basically a, a, a cubby hole when uh, the British were coming. Um, and so when uh, white informants are asked about that story or to relate that story, uh, when they do so, they relate the story as uh, one in which to illustrate the loyalty of the enslaved people to the Jefferson family, that the enslaved people would go through the lengths of hiding the family silver so that way it could be safe kept. When the black people tell that story, the descendants of, of Jupiter or, or Caesar, they're telling that story, not because it demonstrates the loyalty to the family, but because it demonstrates that, well, they're trying to save themselves. And just in case uh, the British did in, uh, in the United States, then they might also come out with something and have the, the silver for themselves, right? So i uh, very interested to, to know uh, why stories are being transmitted, as Justin said, but also the, the accuracy, of course, matters too for me. Mm-hmm. Alan? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree totally with Andrew. I suppose the only thing I'd say is that we just have to be very, very careful when we're translate, transmitting the oral, oral histories that we, we ne- negotiate them and we, we talk, use them in ways that don't kind of, uh, uh, don't kind of make them uh, as this is the only way in which this can be seen or said. You know, that there is multiplicity to these stories 
more ways and multiple perspectives. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, for, for me, I, I, to contribute to this, I would say that accuracy matters and the story itself matters. You know, why these people are telling this story. And you tell both of them. You, you yeah, can right. say, you know, it's true that because uh, some of the stories that are told, we know can't be right because we know this person, their ancestor, whom they're referring to, wasn't born then or, you know, wasn't there then. Um, so the story is important, figuring out, you know, why they're telling the story. But you can also say, you know, well, this is what we know from other kinds of, uh, of information. So it's not either or. It's that, you know, here's what was said. It's important to have that relayed, but also to put it in the context, if you have other information that uh, tells a, a more, quote, accurate story of it, that that goes with it as well. It's about yeah. putting them putting them together. Yeah, and I, I want to amend my response a little bit, too, because I, I guess what I'm, I am in agreement with everyone. And I'm, I'm thinking now that oral history is valuable, regardless of whether or not it's true or, or not. Mm -hmm. you know, there's still inherent value in, mm -hmm. in just what's being communicated and then you know trying to parse through you know why it's being communicated and i think you know one of the one of the things i, I really appreciate about oral history is that it, it creates research questions you know for, for those of oh, us absolutely. Who, are conducting, right, who are conducting you know oral history interviews and we're able to then you know use that to guide you know where we're looking for for answers and, and context right mm -hmm. i could think of many different examples where an oral history has has kind of redirected you know, oh absolutely it, I mean, what you guys are describing, what we're talking about here in some ways is detective work. And if you like that kind of thing, and I do, and I, I suppose we all do, uh, it's it's a wonderful way to, it's a starting point to answer questions. Well, why does the person think this? And very often there's something, it's like the, the people in, I guess, in Southern Africa who claimed descent from um, uh, Jewish people, that they were part Jewish and and people can't figure out, you know, what is the story or why are these people telling the story about Cohen and them being a part of all of this? And it turns out, I mean, with the, you mentioned before DNA testing, that there are connections here. And so you don't know how it happened, but the fact that they're telling the story and getting some things right and some things wrong means that there's something there. And that's a fertile ground for you to go to discuss these things. Um, I'll go to another question. Uh, Sherry Huerta. What are some of the ways you curate or balance the private nature of memories and stories with or into a public facing interpretation? So once you've heard these stories, how do you, how does it get to, uh, how do you create a public facing interpretation of it? One that so you, makes you sense. Per, yeah, you, you asked permission, right? Uh, so we, we, we establish the relationships, we, we engage with one another, we listen to one another, we record an oral history interview if, uh, if that is something that, mm -hmm. that we want to happen. We archive that, that interview and we ask permission uh, from the informant to then uh, potentially use their information or their stories in public facing interpretation. So we would never do that otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more question. Um, this is for all the panelists. Do you think that oral history techniques will be used by historians more frequently now, especially to document, ev document events that are still fresh? The 2016 election, the pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think they, they're, they're going to come to the fore. I mean, when we when you think about activists mm -hmm. and uh, the the amount of things they have to say, and the amount of things that um, need to be said about well, in Britain, that amazing moment of Black Lives Matter following on from the the American moment, it's a different moment, and it's a moment that needs its own interpretation. And the people who who were involved were often very new to politics, exceptionally new to politics. And they'll have very new things to say. In Lancaster, uh, where I live, people stood up for the first time in a in a in a open public uh, demonstration and spoke out. And we in Lancaster Black History Group are gathering together those kinds of oral narratives, um, uh, 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 and but also taking them not 
just to talk about that moment, but changing them into a movement. So kind of thinking about those um, those narratives and making something of them, which is why we started this project to look at Lancaster's black history, because the people who, who started to speak up then said, well, why don't I know about this history? And they don't know about it because it wasn't there nearly enough for them when they went through school and things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that though, I think that it's a moment when we're, we're going to have a lot more of those, more oral history here in Britain, at least, of that movement. Do you guys agree? I do. It's, it's easier than ever to, to, to record voices, and, and we should be doing that. And, and I think not just for, for, for recent events, the 2016 election or, or, or the pandemic or Black Lives Matter, but also in this moment to capture as, as many of voices of our elders as we possibly can. In our family conversations, ask permission and, 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 and record digitally the, the voice of, of your grandmother or, or grandfather. Um, I, I think we we have the opportunity and the technology to do so, so let's take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Justin, yeah, I'll give you the last word. Oh, no, I was just gonna say I 100% agree. And I think there's so many you know resources that can can help us become better oral historians, even if you've never you know, participated in a you know, formal academic training program. Um, I think you know, obviously the, the most important thing is to make sure you hit record. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. I suppose the other thing is that we can communicate across geographical boundaries now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, our activists here had a discussion with activists in Bremen live mm -hmm. on a podcast. It's the Urban Political Podcast, mm -hmm. and so so that's recorded for posterity now. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and and I think there's a lot of those kinds of interactions going on, which will be really useful for the historians of the future. Well, this has been a great discussion. Um, thank you all for participating in it and for the audience questions. This is a great way to close out this symposium uh, with people becoming their own historians in ways, understanding that we're all a part of history right. and we have ways to contribute. So thank you guys very much. And I hope to see you in person soon someday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.